Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to New Books in Chinese Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. My name is Suvi Rautio, and I'm one of the hosts of the channel. And on the podcast today, I'm joined by Professor Xiang Biao, who is director of the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology. Xiang Biao will be talking about his new book, Self as Method, Thinking Through China and the World, which was originally written and published in Chinese. The English translation has just come out with Palgrave Macmillan just this year, at the beginning of this year. Self as Method provides a manifesto of intellectual activism that counsels China's young people to think by themselves and for themselves. Consisting of three conversations in Beijing in March 2018, followed by an interview eight months later in Oxford, and finally in Wenzhou in December 2018, between Xiang Biao and a social anthropologist and Wu Qi, a rising journalist. The book probes how China has reached its current stage and how young people can make changes to their lives. The Chinese version, Ba Zi Ji Zuo Wei Fang Fa, was named the most impactful book of 2021 by Douban, China's premier website for rating books, films, and music. The English version, which is entirely open access, was translated by David Elmby and has almost 150,000 downloads in just, sorry, 157,000 downloads in just over a couple of months. I had to refresh that number. Um, I checked two weeks ago and it's gone, gone up by 7,000 downloads. I will be discussing the book in more detail with Xiang Biao, who I have the pleasure of joining me on the show today. Biao, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. Pleasure. So let's get started. How did you and Wu Qi come to collaborate and work on Self as Method? Well, for this, I think we really should thank our editor, Ro Dan Ni. Uh, that what it was probably 2017, I think. It was, uh, I remember it was quite cold in Beijing. And Danny uh, contacted me, uh, asked me whether or not I would be willing to write a book for uh, Chinese young people. And I, but this is not something I had in my mind. You know, I have been a quite a conventional academ- academic anthropologist. Uh, I did the uh, work with young people, but I never thought of writing uh, a public book. Uh, so I asked her why, I mean, why she thinks such a book is, is uh, needed, and especially why me, because there are so many uh, good uh, popular writers around in China. And she told me something like that. Uh, based on her reading of some interviews that I gave to uh, newspapers, and I think at that time probably not newspaper anymore, it was of social media sites, she thought that I uh, was able to provide a big picture description of the Chinese society. And in the picture, individual young people can see themselves they can relate their life experiences to the big picture. So therefore, there are lots of questions that they face in everyday life can be clarified, can be explained through the big picture analysis. Uh, So I was uh, quite encouraged by that because after all, this is what the social science is for. You provide a picture for people in a way that is meaningful for them to understand themselves and what is happening around them. Uh, so then I proposed uh, of the format of conversation, you know, interview. Uh, I said, okay, if I just write, because I don't know what kind of questions the young people are most interested in, and also once I start writing, I may fall into the trap of this kind of quite boring academic a reasoning and a literature referencing uh, rather than get to the point quickly. And Danny liked the idea and she introduced to me Wu Qi, uh, who is a friend of hers, a, a great journalist, uh, used to uh, work in a Xinhua news agency and later I think he joined the Dan Xiangjie 
one way street, a, 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 a publishing house as well as a cultural. You can say it's a it's a, a, a cultural product company. Yeah. So this is how uh, we met Wu Qi, and we met for that purpose of talking about Chinese society, especially uh, how to lead a meaningful life as a young person in China uh, at that time. And it's, uh, when we met, when we started working, I think that was already uh, 2018. Yeah, so this is how it started. So just to clarify, um, Biao, you, you, were not, you, you were not aware of the social media responses or, or of this impact you were having on on, on um, Chinese youth through social media before your editor reached out to you. Um, that's that's really quite remarkable um, that, that, I mean, how, how aware of you of, of um, how the responses you were receiving from Chinese youth um, before before you, you started working with, with your editor and, and with Wu Qi? I must say I wasn't very much uh, aware. I mean, I, um, you know, I was kind of in hibernation. Uh, we can talk about that, about the, the very professionalized academic life. Sometimes it, it uh, freezes you away from the real world. I, I thought I was in hibernation. After I did my PhD, um, you know, they was worried about all these uh, professional goals and etc. Um, then things uh, they changed a bit in uh, 2014. I remember that very vividly because I really uh, felt um, suffocated. The, the, you know, it's, um, it has a sense of intellectual loneliness and also has a sense of being irrelevant to the world. Um, then often just writing for the sake of writing without really deepening the thought, uh, let alone speaking to the public. So in 2014, another journalist, Guo uh, Yujie, uh, a journalist working for the new the, the media called Jie uh, Mian Interface, uh, it is still, I think, a very active uh, media, uh, reached out to me for, now I can't remember what was uh, uh, the reason that she reached to me. I mean, was it a particular uh, uh, question or event? I can't remember. But uh, we talked about a uh, lot of things, and, uh, uh, and the, the, the point uh, that I made, which eventually you know, became quite a, was quite well received, was a point uh, about uh, suspension meaning that many people in China uh, live their life as if they are kind of a hummingbird. They, uh, they flap the wings uh, frantically uh, just in order to stay, stay still in air. They're very deeply worried that if they stop flapping the wings, they will drop to the ground. And, uh, but they work so hard in order to stay still, but the, but the thing itself, I mean, the staying still itself has no meaning. You, know? you all work hard just to, to, to keep yourself uh, afloat. Uh, that, I think, attracted some attention uh, from uh, uh, Chinese youth. Probably I received some email messages from my audiences soon after that. But it was not that... Um, Overwhelming, I must say. I mean, I, I felt very satisfied given how I felt lonely before. So I was satisfied, but I did not regard myself as a, 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 an obvious uh, popular writer. But after that, I also wrote uh, something about Hong Kong the, the, due to the, uh, the umbrella movement, which also took place in 2014. And I wrote about um, the educated youth education who played a key role in the development of social sciences as well as in economic reform after the Cultural Revolution, because at that time they were in their 30s, 40s, in the 1980s. So they were the most active age group in the Chinese society. So I reviewed their kind of life history and how that is related to Chinese politics, etc. Uh, that also uh, was widely read. Uh, so uh, I was encouraged uh, by the responses, but still I 
uh, uh, compared to you know after the book was published, I think it's a quite uh, quite a different. Uh, so now I'm speaking my memory of what happened in 2016, 2017, uh, uh, from the the. the, the Vantage point of now. I mean, now, of course, I just uh, almost every week uh, there's a online discussions or there is a, a, a public conversations and a large number of email from uh, young people in China from different social economic background, etc. So, so now it become a routine part of my life. But that was not the case uh, in 2018. That's really that's really re- remarkable to to hear, um, and I think that's one thing I really personally enjoyed about your book was so much the way that um, Wu Qi is able to kind of help you through his questions, help you recite your own memories, and how how the reader can kind of follow you through your different life journey from Wenzhou to to Beijing and then Oxford. Um, um, this was written, you know, th- these are interviews in 2018. So, so it ends, it ends um, in Wenzhou again. Um, but it's so fascinating to hear you now, now speak in hindsight of this kind of hibernation that you were living in as an academic. And I'm sure anybody who's listening to this show is familiar, familiar with that hibernating. <laughs> that's, that's not required, but it becomes kind of second nature and just the nature and it just the way that, you know, academic publishing and then the whole system is kind of structured. Yeah, I want to, I wish to use this opportunity to convey a message to all uh, the friends who are listening who feel that they are in hibernation. I mean, the message is very simple. Do break out. There's a great fun and lots of enjoy. <laughs> um, absolutely. I mean, that's that's good to hear even for me. It's 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 difficult to break out. But just to clarify, so so when you were writing these articles in 2014, they were, or when or when you were working on on these projects or these themes in 2014, you were still writing in English, or were you you were using different platforms to write in Chinese um, that that reached out to then these the wider um, Chinese speaking um, youth population? Great question. Uh, at that time, uh, you know, I was still writing. Uh, spend most of my time writing English academic articles that are hoping to be published, to be recognized, etc. But uh, uh, I use Chinese to write uh, my thought. You know, if I see something, if I think something, uh, then I was using Chinese. So it's the English and the Chinese are not only two languages, uh, but they just mean a uh, very different uh, uh, the way of, of expressing and the way of thinking. Uh, so the 2014, I uh, wrote uh, some long essays in Chinese, and as well as I uh, gave interviews to, to media. Yeah. So from 2014. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely something that that comes out in, in the book itself and in your interviews. I think that's quite interesting, you know, this this idea of language and, and I'm guessing it was just something you were more comfortable perhaps with or something that you, you maybe wanted to write in, in using using Chinese um, and then other stuff written in English. But But again, what I really liked about the book was that you basically you're telling Chinese youth to think for themselves and through their own experiences um, make sense of the contradictions around them, which, and, and rather than, I mean, you're doing that by reflecting on your own um, experiences and your own, what you've encountered through contradictions around you, through your research, but also through your personal life experiences. Um, I really like this, this reminder of making sense of contradictions, um, which you do so by, by reminding readers to um, pay attention to concrete details in, in conflict situations. Um, and you write about the importance of, or you talk about the importance of socializing with people who might bring up uncomfortable topics as a reminder that these events can also be stimulating. And I think that's something that um, is quite 
difficult to to do, especially in the current age with you know political polarism and and just um, people just becoming more insular and and unwilling to be faced with with the with conflict, of course, but also you know uncomfortable, un- uncomfortable topics, uncomfortable ways of thinking or, or seeing the world that doesn't match with our own. Um, but as I was reading the, your book, it really, you know, this is something I tried to when I put the book down and, and walked around um, the city. Something I try to pay attention to is when 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 I was com- confronted with something that could have been uncomfortable, rather than stepping away to kind of recognizing that this can also be stimulating. Um, but could you talk a bit more um, about what it means to pay attention to conflict situations for, sorry, what it means to pay attention um, to conflict situations for listeners to understand what you mean by this? Why why is paying attention to conflict important for you? Mm-hmm. No, that's, uh, you put it in a the very nice context. Um, uh, sorry, you put it in a current context very nicely. I mean, the current context is not a nice context, but the way contextualize it is very pertinent. Uh, I mean, that is precisely one of the main reasons I think it is important to pay attention, close attention to concrete problems and contradictions around you. Uh, the reason is that one of the re- problems that we are facing now is precisely the breakdown of a public communication, the, the polarization of opinions, and the one social group regards the other as enemies rather than potential uh, partners for, for dialogue. And then we think, oh, why the situation becomes so bad? I mean, it's not all, people always have different opinions, but why now become such a black and white situation? Not only in, I mean, we will think the U.S. probably is the most obvious example of such a uh, polarization, uh, but in China too, uh, especially now after COVID, or you can, well, kind of after the zero case policy, but uh, the COVID itself is far from uh, ended. And, you know, in Chinese society, there's, there's lots of groups uh, just accuse uh, each other on a very you know, moralized and ideological grounds. Uh, then if we think carefully, is are there anybody who support zero case policy would say, okay, we have to uh, implement that policy regardless uh, whether you are starving or whether you have basic access to uh, medical care, even in the situation of emergency, or you are forced to commit suicide, etc. We still have to uh, carry out the zero case uh, policy. I'm afraid, uh, I'm pretty sure there are very few persons like that. And on the other hand, okay, people say, oh, there's a, such a group called uh, the, a coexistence group, basically is against zero uh, case policy. But how many people can you find within this uh, camp who would say, oh, we have to lift up all these restrictions overnight without any preparation, without the proper vaccination, without all this medicine being uh, 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 the, the properly supplied. Very few people uh, would have that kind of opinion. So the debates during COVID, I'm just taking this example, is very much about the details. You know, I mean, the zero case policy could have a point, but the question is that how you are going to implement it? How you are going to explain to different populations why is that needed and how it should be carried out? The same with the, the, the lifting up a policy. And then how should we lift up and step by step what kind of preparations are necessary, what could be possible consequences, and how people should be prepared for all these kind of consequences. I mean, that is the, the thing to be discussed. But then you ask why people do not spend energy to discuss that very concrete, detailed plans, and rather people just divide the society into such a two antagonistic black and white camps. 
So if you are zero case policy, I mean, you are a person like this and this, I mean, they have a profile, you know, the kind of whole profiling uh, uh, going on in, in, in discussion and uh, vice versa. So if you are the belong to the so-called uh, uh, the coexistence, I mean, coexistence meaning coexist, coexisting with, uh, with the virus, so therefore uh, lifting up, uh, then you must be a person you know, who holds this view or that view, uh, again, you know, have this kind of totalizing, profiling uh, each other. So therefore, you are no longer uh, debating about policy issues. You are really uh, imagining each other as a type of a person. So it become a personality attack. So then why do, do, do have we ended up in this situation? One of the reasons is that we citizens, especially young people, lost the capacity to look at the social issues in a very concrete way. Because of social media, because of the impatience to examine how things really happen. So whatever happened, people very quickly use abstract categories and often you know, ideologically loaded concept to make a quick package. Okay, this is A, and within A, it's like this, like that. And this is a B, you know, it's a stance and a position about certain things, and that's a type of person who supports this and that. So it's all about dividing the society and to different lines, and then it's questions about you know, which line you choose, rather than look at the more concrete issues. So I think uh, the young people, if the young people uh, develop, uh, you can say, habit, of, of looking at the life in a much more low-key but detailed way. And they try to find something fun, something interesting in details. And uh, probably our discussion will be very different. And just a very quick uh, footnote. I mean, one of the reasons that I uh, promote, was promoting this uh, perspective was uh, the, based on my observation of students uh, in Oxford uh, students from China, but as well as from many other parts of the world. And as a student, uh, they can talk a lot about uh, global issues and uh, you know, large questions, etc. But then you ask uh, him or her, okay, could you please give me an account about your parents' life? Who they are, what kind of life they have lived through, what are they worried about, what, where are their dreams when we were young, and how do they feel about their dreams before? Can you tell me about your neighbors and what do they do, how they make a living, and uh, what kind of uh, housing you are living? Is a condominium or, or it's an it's a, uh, individual house? Uh, what is the price? What the uh, housing market is like, and etc. Very few young people can give a clear and a concrete account about their own life. So I think that is absurd. And I think it turned out to be dangerous because if you don't know the, how you are related to your surrounding and therefore how you are related to the larger society and the world in a concrete way, then you will become a person kind of rootless, uh, intellectually rootless and socially without anchor, so you'll be easily pushed to a certain extreme by all these big messages and the emotionally charging stories being circulated in the social media. So that is the, I mean, one of the reasons that I was promoting that way of looking uh, at the world. Uh, that is not only a cognitive question, it is really also a matter of uh, attitude towards life, you know, how you enjoy life uh, through uh, by, by thinking through all the details and the very concrete connections to people around you, like cleaners, the security guard in your condominium, and your neighbors, and etc. And don't think too much about all these grand issues that are far away. I mean, it's not a refusal to think, but in order to think big things, you have to think through small things first and then try to think through what's the relation between the big things and the small things, which most people are affected directly after all. 
That was that was fantastic. I'm I'm that was not so much a footnote, but rather I feel like a, quite at the core of 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 um of the book itself. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, this idea of returning to the local to observe the everyday in its texture. This is something that each of these conversations you have with Uchi in the book are kind of brought to the fore. Um, so my understanding as well through through this idea of looking at the local and understanding who you are um, also allows for the potential for individual agency. But in order to, as you just clarified, in order to pursue that, it requires a problematization or problematizing one's own personal experiences to grasp where you are and where you stand in society itself. Um, and this mission of understanding one's place in the world can be interpreted interpreted as a psychological exercise but rather which i really which is why i liked your book so much is you're moving away from that to remind people to look inward um in 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 in, in order to look outward to, to objectify our experiences and again this is not um a way of following the rhetoric which is popular um in everyday discourse especially on social media today which is you know this kind of well-being narrative guiding people to love yourself um but instead what you're doing is you're trying to remind you're trying to by looking inward and at the same time objectifying yourself, you're trying to guide um, readers to reach a sense of harmony between historical limit limitations and their current ambitions. Um, and again, this is so vital in today's age because it's something that gets hidden in the constant social media content that's being circulated, especially through social media, but of course, you know, beyond as well. I think, as you just mentioned as well, I think it's something that anybody who does do something on social media is going to be confronted by. And it kind of, at the same time, we, we forget that who we are and where we stand in society. And we, we do have our own place in society that doesn't just exist in the virtual realm. realm. But um, my question in this, and, and perhaps this was my own misunderstanding um, in your in the reading of your book. Um, I was I was left wondering this this um, how how far should people push for change, or how far are you are you claiming to push for change? Because I was I kept thinking about um, you know the, the circumstances, the, the status that people have in society. Um, oftentimes, they're also con constrained by that status um, in their living condition. In, and by constrained by their living conditions, for example, people who are living in poverty or you know economic instability, how does seeking that agency in themselves to work through reflection? How does that? What kind of change should 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 they be pursuing? And, and is that my misunderstanding that this change that you're that you're um, encouraging or or the kind of this this um the, the thinking the, the change in thinking that you're encouraging is just at you know it's at the grassroots local level and i'm pushing this to something much bigger than perhaps what you're what you're pursuing well that is a very very critical question so yeah so uh probably my thought is not disorganized is a slightly disorganized because it's such a rich question I and mean, let me try first of all uh, you said the the, the notion of uh, you know problematize our own experiences is very crucial. And um, uh, in China, there's also debates about the method of self as a method. People say oh, isn't too self centric. Uh, you you take self so seriously. Is that healthy? Uh, the whole point of um, self of method is uh, is kind of actually the opposite to 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 that approach. Uh, self as a method, why do you take self as a method? Because we have a subject matter that is not the self. What is a subject matter? What is our core concern? It is a life, society and the world. But how do you really understand the life? How do you really understand the world? And more importantly, what kind of understanding can inform your action, can inform your judgment, can inform how you develop relations with the people around you as well as far away? You have to take a certain method in order to reach the deep and the consequential understanding. So that is what the self as a method means. I mean, the landing point is world 
but not the world just out there, but the world that you are part of and the world you will act on. This is number one. Number two, this is why we talk about problematize yourself. Then you look at, okay, I become, I, uh, it's uh, just through all these childhood experiences, and you know, my parents' social positions, and what my neighbor said, and etc. It's all in a very concrete way that I become I. So it's a very complex, and but very rich and real relation between I and the world. So you take that as a method to figure out how the world come into being and how you can interact with it. Uh, uh, and the, then self as a method does not start with a uh, kind of closed self as a coherent entity. I mean, self as a method implies by definition unpacking the self. You have to open up the self, examine the self as a landscape, as rivers or the forest. There's lots of dark corners and lots of unsolved questions and then uh, lots of something it upset you all the time and you can't control, can't explain, it, etc. So it is uh, to, 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 to open uh, uh, yourself up. So that is, as you mentioned, is very different from the notion of self-care and self uh, uh, assertion and uh, confidence um, it's 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 a, a, a quite different and i the other day i was talking to young people here in germany um they said that one thing uh, this, uh, this is a very uh, 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 kind of uh, characterize how they discuss with a friend in social media or even in kind of uh, the physical setting offline is it's an accusation of how dare you? How dare you? If the person said something you regard as politically incorrect or something offensive, so how dare you became a kind of standard uh, response? Uh, that's I thought is interesting. The very fact that we start a, a discussion, or uh, not necessarily start, but very much uh, you know, constantly. Uh, uh, resorting to this line, how dare you? It, it, it just very much assumes there is a very closed self and very enclosed others. And you and me, we hold the very different ideological uh, convictions and we're very different persons. So the, the, the most important thing is to classify, to judge who is correct and who is not correct. So then the discussion becomes a, a, a battle over correctness, rather than I open myself up and you open yourself and see, oh, why we have different views and how fascinating. You and me are quite a similar age, you grow up in similar situations and why our understanding are so different. It is the become intellectually very stimulating uh, a conversation. So that is, uh, uh, I want to say, uh, just to follow what you elaborate a bit more, what you mentioned earlier, the notion of, of self. Um, and then you ask a very critical question about the change. If self as a method is all about the understanding, and then what about the critiques? What about uh, if you are un unhappy with the current situation, uh, how are you going to change? Here, this is something that uh, just uh, came to my mind now when I listened to your question, which I was not uh, written in the book. I would say there's two types of change. We have to make a distinction. One type of change, you can say, is self-improvement. In Chinese society, uh, you know, in over the last 40 years, there was no shortage whatsoever of this type of desire for change. Ambition, self-motivation, getting better, improvement, and etc. How do you change yourself in this way? That is what I mentioned earlier, suspension. You just keep moving from one place to another, and sometimes physically through you know, this hypermobility, changing job every two, three or four months, uh, constantly changing and working extremely hard uh, try to capture all possible opportunities, but you have no time to confront problems here and now. 
And you may think it's stupid to spend time and energy to solve any problem right now, like in you know, relation with your colleagues, uh, relation with your uh, dormant mates. Uh, and because you may no longer be friends with them because your situation may improve so much that you will be in a different world or their situation may improve so dramatically so you will be a different type of person. So all what you do is to make sure that you will not lag behind in the fierce competition. So it's a lot of ambition about change. This is type one. Then there's a type two change is that how can you change the society, the condition, the overall condition under which you have to compete so hard with others? So how do you change the system, the condition beyond you, but yet from which you cannot escape? For that type of change, you need a very realistic, concrete understanding about relation between you and the people around you, you and the local surrounding. To pursue the first type of change, you are very busy because now you are put in the system, you know, the pressure cooker or this, uh, uh, you can say, the treat the meal system. You work very hard and exhaust yourself. In order to achieve second type of change, ironically, probably the most radical action you can take now is to not to work so hard. I mean, this is, I mean, the, the pumping, the lying flat. I don't think it is a kind of serious social movement yet, but it is a radical sentiment. It's a feeling. Basically, people say, okay, I stop competing with each other. I stop forcing myself to work so hard. It sounds quite passive, but as a sentiment, actually, it is very radical because they want to say no to the general condition. So in order to pursue that type of change, we have to start with a new understanding about a very concrete relation between yourself and others. And in order to do that, you have to examine your own experiences in detail. Why do I feel so unhappy? Even though I get the rewards, I have good jobs, I may have decent a middle-class-like lifestyle. Why do I feel unhappy? I feel empty uh, in terms of meaning. Uh, so you, 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 if you start your paying uh, attention to details, you will get this new type of energy, which is kind of low-key, but more sustained, that may empower you to make small movements every day, that start changing the overall condition rather than just improve yourself within the predefined system according to the criteria that are set by other people. Wow, thank you so much for that clarification. That was that was really enlightening. Um, just just for the listeners um, who, who have not yet read Self as Method, this is something that Xiangbiao also does reflecting on on you, uh, Biao, you're also reflecting on this through your own experiences, and I think that's what makes your story so remarkable. It's not this kind of it. You're also opening up that uh, that honesty to to who you are and your past and where you are today, which is I think what makes um, self as method so inspiring and and easy to to relate to or to to pursue. Yeah, no, I think that's probably is uh, nothing too remarkable because you can't really examine the world if you don't examine the self. Yeah, I think that is uh, actually everyone is doing that, but ironically, intellectuals, academics, sometimes they hide that part. Yeah, so exactly. if they acquire some magical skills that they can examine the world very objectively <laughs> without opening themselves up. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, another thing that you do that you return to in your book is this this idea of the gentry perspective. Um, what is unique about this perspective, and why are you drawn to it? Oh, um, probably it's not that unique, uh, but I just feel it. I mean, first of all, it's my personal experiences. I feel my temperament is quite close to the temperament of gentry. Uh, who are the gentries? The gentries are 
Uh, of course, I mean, the, we have to understand, recognize uh, the historical limit. They are, pri- I mean, they're almost exclusively male, uh, coming from the relatively well off, but, but still peasantry f- families, and probably they uh, have a certain uh, gift of, you know, can start recognizing characters very early on. So, therefore, okay, the family think, oh, there's a boy, uh, could one day. A, a study, you know, become kind of a scholar or, uh, rather than just a pedant. And uh, they started hard and normally they tried, but in, in many cases they, they did participate in a civil servants' uh, examination, Kirchhu. And uh, then if you became uh, successful in the exam and became uh, officials, then that you are no longer gentry. Gentry is normally, you don't have official title, you don't receive salary from the state. Uh, So the gentry, that person who did not succeed in the civil servants exam, or persons who retired or resigned from the official positions, uh, then they all go back to their country a village in the countryside, a village. I mean, this is a, I, 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 I think I mentioned in the book, right? It, it is a, a turning point in the Chinese history uh, that um, retired officials uh, no longer went back to the rural home village right? because before it was always a pattern. If you uh, retired from even very high position in the capital city in Beijing or Nanjing. The first choice is to went back to your home village. So there is a very organic uh, uh, circular relation between the countryside and the cities and the grassroots and the center of politics. But of course, in modern time, that become unthinkable. I and mean, how many people uh, retired uh, senior officials today would go back to their home village. Um, Janjuri is that type of person. So what do they do? Uh, they are teachers in the village and teaching kids uh, the, the Confucius classics, and they um, uh, arbitrated uh, the disputes, and they organized the public projects such as irrigations and also rituals, uh, in different seasons and etc. So they are the cultural core of local community. And of course, they also play a role of maintaining public order, but through very cultural means and through the teaching of Confucius uh, uh, ethics and etc. Another important role that they played is, is as, uh, as kind of to in- intermediate between the community and the state, if there is a famine, if the bad harvest in that year, so it was a gentry who would go to the county level government to say, the peasants are really suffering this year, so therefore you have to reduce the levy or or agricultural tax. Uh, We can think of a way to compensate for that next year when the future, the harvest is good again. Uh, so they prevent the state power from becoming too uh, predatory uh, on the behalf of the community. But also sometimes they also play a different role. You know, they still claim their cultural superiority in relation to uh, peasantry by t- t- kind of playing up their connections with officials and etc. So all that is their um, uh, historical role, and the uh, gentry is uh, important of, in Chinese hi- history because it, uh, their role explained why China's su- uh, empire of such vast territory, huge number of populations, could be maintained through very small bureaucracy over thousands of years. So the social order was not based on the formal bureaucracy, not based on military, not based on coercion, but it's based on a cultural order. 
But cultural order is not non- I mean, something. It's not something just abstract and idea, etc. You need some people <laughs> in everyday life to maintain this cultural order. I mean, so the gentry, you can say, it's a foot soldier of this cultural order. For me, gentry is uh, uh, interesting, not because they are order, you know, they, they they are order keepers. I'm as a person, I'm uh, I, I I tend to be kind of the slightly anarchic and the style. But the, but the gentry is charming for me because of their way of knowing. They know their surrounding very well. And uh, so everything, I mean, the, in the gentry's eyes, everything is a very empirical, meaning, you know, oh, how peasants uh, the, the, the start the, 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 the uh, production, agricultural production in the beginning of the year, and how do they organize the family relations, and if you they dispute with neighbors, uh, what makes them really angry, and what will calm them down? And the gentry needed to know this because they have to step in uh, to organize all this uh, uh, nitty gritty agricultural productions or settle uh, disputes in the community. So they don't start. Uh, 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 their understanding about life with the big categories and such, because if you do that, you will never understand what the peasants really think. But they are not same as a modern social scientist who believes that everything must come from so-called empirical evidence. The gentries know the details very well, but then they will give meanings to these details. So they have this kind of normative picture has certain cosmology to say, okay, you know, the parents, uh, the, the, the peasants, uh, they know why, what the parents want or why do they uh, have disputes. But they will step in to say, I understand you, but, you know, there is a set of principles that we should all agree. Hmm? So you are doing this, uh, is understandable in a certain sense, but it will violate some... Uh, the, general principles, which means in the long run, it will be bad for yourself and for everyone. Right? So they have a set of language, which is primarily from Confucius uh, uh, ideology, of course. But anyway, so they combine the very detailed understanding, very empirical understanding of life with a certain kind of normative cosmology. And then they do it in a very organic way because their business is not to write a sociological report about their village life. Their business is to coordinate village life to reach harmony within the community. And I think, by and large, it's for the collective well-being of the community. I mean, of course, you can say, you know, gentries are not... Uh, uh, revolutionaries uh, in the most of the time. But I must say that the very important rural revolutionaries in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s were children of gentries. I mean, if you read the mouse uh, surveys, early surveys about rural China, and he has a very interesting uh, conclusion. He says... He said that who are the revolutionaries in the countryside? Children of the biggest landlords, the main gentries. They are the revolutionaries because these are the people who are not too worried about their own material well-being. And these are people young and they read a lot and they went to, at that time, in Mao's report, the Changsha or Shanghai. In the big cities where progressive ideas were circulated, and they got those ideas and became radicalized and they came back. At the same time, they inherited their parents' spirit uh, of you know, being responsible for the, the, for the peasantry and have the notion of normative cosmology and etc. But now the young people think the old cosmology is wrong, so we need a new type of uh, moral compass and uh, 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 cosmology, what is that? Socialism, you know, you, 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 you distrib- uh, distribute land to peasants and such, it's like this is what Peng Pai did in, in, in Guangdong. Uh, so they, the gentries could become revolutionaries, why? Because they know the situation, the peasants' life from inside out, and the number, this is number one, number two, they know that 
life for a purpose. It's not just knowing for the sake of knowing. The knowing in for the purpose of leading a ethical life at the collective level. So all this is very、uh, charming for me. And、uh, I'm not sure it's unique or not, but I think it's very valuable today for young people in China as well in the world. Because number one, it is different from as、uh, a narrow、uh, scientism understanding of the world. You know, everything can be reduced to numbers, figures, and、uh, there's no such thing as a, a moral uh, uh, a compass or, or, or cosmology. I mean, this situation now become almost absurd with the rise of big data. Right? Big data tells you don't stop asking. About the theories, stop asking about interpretation. Stop asking about the meanings, because I'm telling you the reality as it is. Why do you need a theory to interpret the reality? Whatever you want to know, I big data will, will tell you. So now we, as if we live in a purely scientific world without the meaning. So the entry spirit is is against that. Number two, the entry、uh, called the spirit. The re- it calls our attention to details. How you see meanings, see interesting things from details inside of the details, and the details as lived experiences.、Huh? It's not like、uh, the fixed and the frozen details. So all that is very、uh, interesting to, to me. But so therefore, the gentry as a way of knowing,、uh, uh, I feel it, it can be、uh, something. Uh, uh, quite a productive for young people to、uh, look into. Yeah, I think that. Thank you. That was that was really beautiful. I was smiling the whole time as you were talking、um, and nodding.、Um, but I think that really overlaps with what we were talking earlier about、um, paying attention to the conflicts and not not being not you know be not being scared of that.、Um, also, I think this this you know the the the, the charm of the gentry class also. My understanding is that it relates to a lot of what you write about or talk about with Uti in the book.、Um, this necessity to close the gap between concepts discussed in the classroom and in real social practice. So I was wondering if we could kind of move the conversation closer to academia, what it means to you. You write about cross、uh, cross border. World,、um, you know the importance of a cross-border world and academic community.、Um, how can we, you know, do is that description that you just gave of the gentry class is that in any way applicable to to what academia means for you or how you've been able to practice it, and、um, how how do you how do you write about it in your book to to kind of inspire your readers to 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 close the gap between what's in the classroom and in real social practice. Yeah, no, that's a, 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 again a very rich question here. There's a, a gaps between、um, knowledge or information as recorded in texts, and then there's a life、uh, going on、uh, in the world, and then there's a gap between、uh, the life around you and the world that is.、Uh, Very much larger than what you can immediately、uh, see, and then there's a gap uh, between uh, the community that、uh, is using one type of language, say national language, and then you have a transnational, as I said,、uh, cross-border、uh, academic community. But the academic community is, I mean, the, this is the 20th century,、uh, the, the major development. I think that is the internationalization of uh, research. Uh, academics normally regard themselves as a cosmopolitan, and、uh, academic research is、uh, increasingly、um, a matter of global conversation. Right.、But、then the question is that okay,、uh, to what extent do global conversation reflect local concerns, local reality? So there is a. In very, in very practical sense, there is a gap between local and global. I mean, if you turn it to, to theoretical question, it's not interesting because you can say whatever you want. There are local and global. You can find the global in local and etc. But, but in a very practical sense, when you、uh, go to、uh, the US, go to New York, or you go to London, present a conference paper. 
to uh, scholars come from different worlds and reading French philosophy. And if we, in that context, when you speak a migrant workers' experiences in South Africa or in India, um, uh, to what extent it is related to what the migrant workers are really worried about and how they want to change their life, what they are really grappling with now, uh, that, uh, that, that, that's a gap is quite big. So these three sets of uh, gaps uh, are all there. That is something we, we have to, to uh, face. And I, if you go back to, to the gentry uh, as one way to resolve or probably at least point out some potential way to reconcile uh, these uh, contradictions, uh, I think that there's something to learn from gentry's uh, experiences. Uh, that is how you look at big questions through small details. Again, very importantly, small details, not only something small, but the small details that you lived through, you know what they mean, and you know why the details are important. I mean, we always say we should pay attention to details, but actually there is a very deep theoretical question to be addressed. I mean, why are details important? You know, the entire world can be reduced to infinite details, and then the, if you just, we just say details are important, then it's basically uh, next to nihilism to say, oh, this is a, the, the, after all, the world is unknowable. What all oh, what we know is these details that we randomly run into. Certainly not true. So the the, the details must be some details according to your own life experiences, according to your closed-up observations, that the details that matters. And then the, the, the details that matters, meaning that it uh, touch people's soul and uh, keep people awake in the night, and the, the details that people think again and again, details that will lead to uh, sustain a certain type of effort, and etc. And that details will lead you to larger questions. And this question is abstract. This question is not something you can see in life directly. But if you get the big questions right, for instance, questions like, uh, what is dignity? Questions like how people develop their ambition and why some people so ambitious and why not, why others not, and how ambition is uh, treated. In some circumstances, ambition is regarded as something very suspicious. In other circumstances, ambition is very much encouraged and very simply, boys' ambition is encouraged and girls' ambitions are often discouraged. Uh, why is that, and etc. So then, you, you, this is big questions, and uh, uh, peop, uh, it's not something immediately observable in everyday life. Uh, you, we will need that big questions. Why? When you have these big questions, and that will lead you to uh, uh, meaningful thinking of the larger world in a concrete way. Step by step, you know, you, you have a basis. The basis is a detailed, uh, experienced uh, uh, observations about the life itself. But from there, you develop big questions. I mean, this is what I meant. The, the gentry perspective um, is charming because it combines empirical, detailed empirical observations with normative uh, cosmology. Right. I mean, you can say you know, in older days, the gentry, the normative cosmology is a bit of a, a frozen because it is a kind of based on the Confucius ideology. Uh, it is not critically examined, is not sufficiently reflexive. That's very true. And we are living in the world much richer, I mean, intellectually much richer than uh, Song or Ming Dynasty gentries because we have access to all kinds of philosophical traditions, all kinds of ways of our lives, and uh, all kinds of different cultures. And we can examine life and reflect on our normative cosmologies from so many different ways. So therefore, we can reach our, enrich our own uh, uh, moral uh, 
uh, cosmology. So uh, the go back to the question of gap, gap between uh, uh, knowledge uh, in the book and the knowledge uh, and understanding in uh, life. Um, so if we, uh, I mean, f- first of all, uh, in addressing this gap, we must uh, pay attention, uh, must uh, stress that it would be stupid if we just throw away all the books to say, oh, you know, the text, they are only a surface, they are all distortion of reality. No, no, no. I mean, the, the, the knowledge being codified, being recorded, archived in texts are very important uh, heritage uh, that we have to uh, carry on because that is a basis uh, from where we can start, we can develop our cognitive capacity and such. But you have to treat them as a part of your nutrition, part of tools. Uh, then you must pay attention to the life in in world and try to see the details, as I said. And what you learn from text, from books, are often some categories, some concepts that may suggest to you to think of certain big questions. So the art of living, art of learning, is to very imaginatively and attentively uh, to take some uh, suggestive big categories, abstract ideas from text and mingle with vivid, lively, sometimes ruthless because it's for so much of life, details that you observed and especially experienced in your own life. Yeah, so that is, is uh, I think, to close up this gap is very, very important. Um, if that gap is not closed, so we will have a very impoverished life because uh, if the life is, is just uh, nothing but all the details, you know, the, as, as it uh, just uh, life goes on as it is without any normative reflection, some thought, uh, to to examine it, so the life will be very in, impoverished. So do textual theoretical knowledge. If there's no new energy being injected into theoretical thinking and the big category thinking from life itself, and then the textual knowledge is just repeating itself or just looking at small holes to say, oh, this text of the 1980s forgot to mention this little hole, so I'm now going to fill it up to make it more complete, I mean, that, uh, I mean, to, to fill the gap in the literature and etc. I mean, why do you need to fill the gap? <laughs> <laughs> and we don't live our life for the sake of completeness of particular literature. Yeah. So that is a way to go ahead, I think. And is this kind of what you know what we what we started this conversation with, this feeling of hibernation that you were experiencing um, you know, twenty fourteen before 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 these before your editor, before other people interested in your work who are more engaged with um, kind of public discourse or through social media were realizing that your your writing was being picked up across the youth in Chinese speaking um, countries or environments and, and encouraging you to kind of step out of this hibernating um, place that you had gotten accustomed to um, is this kind of by through you becoming more engaged you know by engaging with public, with engaging with the public, and and um, doing something like this, the podcast, but of, of course the you know self as method, the book itself is is based around a conversation, and it's written in a way that's that's very readable. At least the English version is, and I'm guessing even more so the Chinese one. You're writing to to the public, you're writing to the youth. So are these exercises for you as well to kind of close that gap? Oh, absolutely. I must say that it has been transformative I mean, uh, over the last few years. Uh, the, the Having conversation with Wu Qi uh, and uh, producing this book uh, is as a part of a larger kind of transformative period that I, I am still going through. Uh, you, know, start, you can say starting from 2014 and then uh, which become <laughs> kind of escalated uh, after the book was published. Uh, so, the, 
and also I moved from University of Oxford to Max Planck Institute, which is a, a, is a research institute rather than university, and which is a, very much encouraged to explore uh, new directions, a new way of doing research. Uh, so all that also kind of encouraged me to become more daring, <laughs> to step out from the usual mode of uh, uh, thinking. Yeah, so that is um, uh, very encouraging. I'm very, very grateful to uh, all the readers. I mean, I can, one thing I must, I mean, that is a, well, I I feel slightly reluctant to say that because you can see how disqualified I have been as anthropologist. I feel that now I'm becoming better anthropologist purely because uh, the push from uh, readers. I mean, most of the readers, of course, are non-anthropologists, the probably they hardly have come across any material or, or, or uh, Arctic publications in anthropology. But they will ask me questions directly related to the life. So they don't ask questions starting with concept. And when they ask a question like that, so there's a very strong emotional di- dimension or affective dimension. You know, I mean, it's about a feeling. You, know, you, you, you have a puzzle about the life. It's very often so associated with a very strong feeling. You have feeling first, and then you start thinking. And then when you think, you will use metaphors, categories, and uh, fragments of experiences before. I was not a qualified anthropologist because I never paid attention to that kind of very subtle feelings and this um, uh, way of thinking about the life from inside of experience itself. You can say this way of thinking is not articulated, not systematic, but it is a kind of exploring. Hmm? And it's colored by uh, very deep, often contradictory feelings, and etc. Uh, when I was uh, writing, you know, academic articles, I always try to be dry, to reduce uh, things into certain formula, because that will give a kind of stable and therefore clear contour of uh, certain phenomenon, and it uh, make it easy to analyze, to reach a certain conclusion, to link it to certain literature, and to make a point to say, you see, I'm now saying something that this and that literature did not say, and etc. So I was uh, uh, quite insensitive towards uh, questions related to feeling, ethics, uh, morality, and also that kind of very fragmented and contradictory way of thinking. But that is supposed to be the main thing uh, anthropologists should have looked into. But due to all kinds of reasons, I was never uh, uh, the, the, I was never able to develop that type of competence. But now, you know, it is really through my public engagement, uh, through the interaction with uh, uh, readers, I started paying attention to that. Yeah, I must say, probably it's not my fault. Uh, you know, before, when I read literature about the feelings, about, I mean, you know, effects and morality, of course, are big topics in academic publications. But I just feel, oh, you know, what can we say about this? It's quite a trivial, it is so elusive, and what is, uh, can we see any big messages here? I don't see much meaning. But now through the public engagement, and I can see how consequential and how important uh, these dimensions are for people who are seriously reflecting on their life. So in order to communicate with them, in order to genuinely understand them, so I will have to pay attention to these uh, subtleties. So this is something, you know, I just give one example. This is supposed to be a very important part of my own academic training, but now I'm receiving this type of training from uh, readers who are probably much younger than me, 
who are even not uh, social science students. I mean, many are probably study business or study engineering. But as people living through life, they ask questions that demand serious, intellectually deep, and theoretically sophisticated answers. If you give them some just uh, you know very abstract, vague answers, they will not be satisfied. There's another point I would like to add. Uh, somehow, I don't know why, academics often think, oh, you know, if you want to do public engagement, you have to make your writing or thinking uh, kind of entertaining. There is a fashion of writing in anthropology as well. You, know, you write it as if it is a novel and make it uh, 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 just very easy to read. I think that is a, a misunderstanding. Uh, my experience of public engagement really taught me that public audience welcome, at least don't mind difficult theories. Why? Because difficult theories make them think. They want to think. What they need is a stimulus, is some tools, some questions that help them to think deeper. Because they have a huge desire to think more care- clearly about their living conditions and their existential questions. So if you just give this sugar can, I mean this uh, sugar coated. Uh, some kind of stuff. Uh, it is. I mean, they would not be happy. So they wanted to be challenged. Of course, I mean, you need to make it understandable and accessible. You know, the, you you the, the, you raise questions that uh, it's recognizable to them and resonate with their feelings. Uh, but otherwise, they don't need some simple solution or quick answers. They know that is not. Uh, I mean, real life is uh, complex, and what do they need is uh, tools to think further, to think more deeply, and to think more clearly. Yeah, I, I think that's a really, really important point, and um, I wonder if that's also a kind of generational shift um, in just, you know, when you're saying that you're writing or talking to people who are much younger than you and me, probably, um, there is much more, you know, young people today, I think regardless of where they are in the world, they do want those tools and they're not as afraid <laughs> um, of, of, you know, having, they're not as afraid to to take them apart and, and they're they're curious in contemplating through them and, and applying them in different circumstances and, and kind of using these kind of puzzle pieces to, to, to yeah, somehow yeah, no, I, paint, paint uh, a picture of the world for themselves. Exactly. I mean, you just think of how much our gender notions have changed. So young people are very daring to challenge all these very basic categories. You know, what is a, being a man? What is a, being a woman? And now that is a very, very wide, uh, deeply accepted norms already among the young people. Namely, there is no fixed norms. So they are thinking, I mean, without the active thinking, you are not be able to tear down such deeply ingrained categories. So they have a very strong desire to think uh, in a very courageous way. Yeah, Absolutely. And another thing as you were talking, well, I had two things as you were talking just now, I wanted to want to mention and, and lead, lead, lead me to my next question. One, um, your comment about your writing being dry. I, I think you're being a bit too harsh on yourself because... Um, I mean, I don't know which which years you're talking about, which publications, but um, I don't think your your article writing is is dry or even close to how dry um, academic writing can be. Um, so I think you are being a bit harsh on yourself. Um, you know, I think you you do have a very you you have a you have this. Um, I guess what makes your writing and your research so so stimulating is that you you do take that to to the context of is if it's policy or or kind of national society kind of the, the wider wider scope so I, my my interpretations of your writing is that you don't of course you you have the theoretical foundation there but it's not for the purpose to make that theoretical claim rather it's it's a very kind of hands-on um 
type of research, at least of what I've read of your work. But I wanted to ask you, um, so so these three, con- the, the book itself is based on the three conversations in Oxford, in, in, in Beijing, and in um, in Wenzhou. And um, I was just wondering, do you, do you have a fourth conversation coming up now that you've moved to, to Germany, to Hal? Um, and on that note, um, I think it's really insightful that you do write about you know the the different research environments or the cultures of these institutions that you've worked in because especially especially for someone like me as a as an early career researcher i think i often overlook these very vast differences in in institutions themselves and you know we're so we're expected to kind of be so driven according to the rank system etc um that we so often forget well what is the culture of that university are they more research oriented are they more teaching oriented and that's something that you really do shed light to in your book you know coming to oxford a much more teaching oriented university and it taught you a lot as well as a teacher um but i'm guessing now it's quite a quite quite a big change being in a more research um institution so i was just wondering my question is um, if I can form it into a question, if you did have a fourth interview with Uti and now in, in Germany, how would it be, would it be radically different? I was going to ask this in relation to, you know, obviously you were writing in 2018, pre-pandemic times, and, you know, you would write of a completely different social situation, completely different, um, you know, government pressures, um, concerns of how to how to re-engage with society, especially um, what, what happened in, in, in November with protests. So of course your conversation, the, the content would be very different. But my question would be more, um, would, it, would it be different because now you're in HAL and you have a different understanding of what self as method is because you're in a different research institution and, and you know, there's been a change in your in your thinking and like an evolution of your thinking because of where you're based mm. yeah so number one as you said uh, you know it's very important to pay close attention to our nearby our kind of mini universe uh, what kind of institute department uh, each of us uh, in and what does it mean for my existence uh, so that is what I meant, a kind of gentry mentality. Uh, it it clarifies lots of things. Actually, it also sometimes I think have psychological benefit. It will calm you down. I mean, I guess this has something to do with the Buddhist, this kind of mindfulness. And if you pay close attention to small details around you, and you will calm down. And then, of course, it will have practical benefit as well, because it will make you... Uh, wiser and make uh, better decisions and we know there is always a gap between your principles and the, what uh, is demanded on you by your environment. That is not a problem. The problem is to understand very clearly, okay, I am my, this is my intellectual agenda, it's my political project and this is my ethical principle and uh, of course I have to make a living and I'm not uh, expecting everyone is the same as me and then, but in, in, in what concrete uh, situation and uh, concrete ways I should interact with them and then I can keep my integrity, uh, uh, all that actually is very, very important uh, 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 skills. I and mean, this is a gentry skill. The gentry is pre-enlightenment. Uh, I mean, certainly they are not uh, part of the European enlightenment uh, uh, tradition. Uh, that is, you you don't make very black and white judgment because making judgment, that kind of very principled judgment, is not the business of life. Life is, I mean, Confucius always thinking life is a matter of regulation. First of all, regulate yourself, your feelings, and etc. And then you through regulate yourself, regulate the relation between you and others, so you find a position. Uh, that will allow you to develop harmonious connections with the world. So that is a kind of a pay attention to, to what kind of institutions uh, we are in and what it means. Uh, it's very important. Actually, it's a capacity. It's a type of social intelligence. And it's a both intellectual and a practical question. 
So whether or not we will have a false uh, 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 interview and uh, how it may look like, it's uh, very interesting because I think just the day before yesterday, Wuchi and Tani, the editor of the book, who initiated the idea of uh, the book of self as a method, we were just talking online and we think it, we need <laughs> continue the conversation. And we may well to have a false uh, uh, conversation and uh, which is hoping to visit uh, Germany. But probably will be the topic we uh, we focus on, I'm mean, just based on what we discussed the day before yesterday, will be less a, a continuation of what we talked before, like self as, as a method, how to understand the relation between a self and the world, but probably will be more about some really urgent questions. We talk about the question of memory or what I call disremembering, which is a big concern in Chinese society, not only now, but also throughout the contemporary history. People suffer and people try to forget. But you know, you cannot forget. So what do you mean you forget? You just don't talk about it. But the scars, the trauma stay in your body, stay in your mind, stay in your psyche. But yet, by refusing to talk about it, you have no way to articulate that feelings. So the feeling just accumulate. Then after a while, it became fear, became certain type of paranoia, or became excessive uh, self-disciplining or discipline of others, like you know how 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 heavy Chinese parents love towards children. Eh? So that is have lots to do with their decent remembering of their own life experiences. Uh, then that type of trauma, suffering, uh, turned into that type of energy, which is very loving, but it can be very oppressive too. I mean, I'm not a psychoanalyst, but that is a kind of a, our naked eye observation of what happened right now. And it's something also uh, we think that probably we should talk about it and remind the people maybe we have to pay more attention to what happened last month, last year, and to uh, give a proper record of all these kind of emotional tsunamis, up and downs that the people experienced, for instance, in 2022. So that will be a, um, a, a conversation. And then uh, is this because I changed my uh, job? Uh, probably not. Yeah, I mean, I mean, changing job will be a minor uh, reason for us to uh, change the topic of conversation. I think now I'm more and more shaped by my relation with uh, the, the the public. And of course, first and foremost, the, the Chinese young public. Uh, my position, current position facilitated uh, this engagement. I'm grateful for that, but I don't think it's a really determining factor. But in a couple of years' time, we also mentioned that we may go back to the question of self uh, and the world and uh, thinking again, you know, what the Max Planck means to me and so therefore uh, uh, what, what uh, it may mean to the uh, 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 world, go back to a slightly more uh, uh, the distanced and the more intellectual question and the less urgent. But for now, our mind is preoccupied by the urgent question. Yeah. So if you don't mind, can I say one more thing? And that, that is a, yeah, resulted from yesterday. Yesterday's very heated debate that we had in my department in, in Max Planck Institute. I was really surprised to see actually, um, how pessimistic uh, many of my colleagues felt about public engagement in different parts of the world. 
Uh, I thought that, you know, what I said, like Chinese young people, they don't mind the difficult questions. Actually, they want the difficult questions because they want to be challenged, stimulated. When you challenge them, they are happy because they feel you are treating them as intellectual equal. You are, yes. you are treating them as a serious, deep thinking subject, as thinkers. But apparently, that is not true at all in many parts of the world. I mean, of course, I don't have my first-hand observations, and I know some about India, but I think Indian society is quite fragmented. Certainly, you have uh, populations similar to uh, the, I mean, the, the young people in China whom I'm engaged with, but probably not others. Uh, so I feel tremendously grateful to the Chinese young people. You know, no matter if people say, oh, this uh, population is selfish and confused, etc. But they keep thinking. They keep asking questions. And the problem is true. They are doing much more, they are doing so much more actively than many of their counterparts population in other parts of the world. I don't know, probably in, in Europe, I mean, in Germany, you still have lots of actively thinking use. But again, that society is quite divided. Uh, but, uh, but probably the critical mass scale of uh, public thinking uh, in China is something we must cherish. Because we now have all the impression, you know, the, the, the political oppressions and uh, the economic stagnation, the things are quite dark. That's all very true. But do not forget, do not forget, under the dark cloud, there are the millions and millions grass uh, asking questions, and they are looking for sunlight. And they want to grow. And they want to grow in a healthy way. They want to grow in a way that other grass will flourish as well. So that spirit, I actually didn't realize how precious it is. I mean, I enjoyed it before, but I didn't know, actually. It is uh, quite special in today's world. Yeah. So probably that is, I mean, number one is something we have to cherish. Number two is something, now I'm just thinking, talking to myself, thinking about it. <laughs> Oh, it's something we, we, we probably should cultivate and make it uh, spread across the world. You know, that kind of, 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 of public urge for ideas, for thought, for critically examining their life experiences uh, is something the whole world needs. And, and actually many, many young Chinese people are doing that. So that is, I mean, not necessarily a gift, but it certainly is a very precious resources uh, that the world can benefit from. Well, thank you so much for adding that. That was that was such a relevant point and something I very much also agree with. Um, I also, I loved your metaphor of the grass. That was really beautiful. Um, I also very much look forward to the fourth interview whatever version, however it comes out, multimodal form or in book form, I really look forward to that coming out as well, as I'm sure our listeners um, do as well. Um, but what, what other projects have you been working on, Biao, recently since you moved to Germany, um, since Self as Method has been published, even though that was just... I mean, it's just been published, so um, that's maybe not such a relevant question. But what kind of what kind of projects have you been working on in, in you know recent recent months yeah. in the past year? Well, um, the, the 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 project that uh, really preoccupy my mind is uh, how to develop the intellectual agenda here for the department. Uh, well, I'm very grateful to, to, to Max Planck Society uh, that uh, I was uh, given this job. I'm not uh, seeing this just uh, out of uh, politeness, because if you look around the world, social science is under threat in many ways. You know, in some countries, like in China, and probably scholars still have decent salaries, but the freedom is uh, very severely, severely constrained. 
And apart from political freedom, I mean, the intellectual environment is also quite distorted for other reasons beyond the political control as well, like this uh, personality relations and this pedigree, uh, etc. Um, and in many other parts of the world, I mean, simply there's uh, not much money uh, being spent on social research. But here we have both freedom and funding. So that is a really feeling that uh, you know, we, we, we have the duty to do something, um, not necessarily understanding anything, but uh, to do something that is meaningful to the world. Not, not just to prove that we are smart and we are okay people. Um, so well, what well, uh, this is uh, I have been worried about what we can do. So we develop this uh, approach called uh, the common concern approach. Common concern approach is um, not a type of academic research that focuses on a particular subject matter question. It is uh, first of all a style of research. So this style of research, it, it, so we, we, we take research as a type of practice, as social practice, right? I mean, research is never it's just a pure intellectual exercise. It's a social practice. You have to, first of all, to think who you are, why do you do this? And then there's so many different ways to ask questions. And why do we ask this question? Uh, uh, this is both uh, social, uh, practical, and uh, uh, intellectual question, I mean, why you choose this question, not the other, and when you ask how do you define it, and how you collect information, and then whom all this research is for, that kind of questions is, cannot be uh, uh, addressed purely on theoretical level. So we, we want to pay attention to, to this type, uh, this aspect, so the very practical aspect of research, and the common concern approach is a type of research that we don't start with uh, academic concept and certainly don't start with uh, gaps in literature or academic knowledge. And we don't aim to accumulate academic knowledge for the sake of accumulation. But rather, we start with what the people are worried about in their life, what kind of concerns they are grappling with uh, now, right? So the examples would be like things like uncertainty, uh, the breakdown of public communication in China, Neijuan, excessive competition, uh, the feeling of uh, powerlessness, so and the increasing pressure. Right, this is a kind of common concern. We start from there. And that is sounds okay, kind of consensible, uh, uh, common sensible. I mean, you just start there, but it's quite difficult to do uh, academic and scientific research because this kind of concerns coming from life, they don't have a clear shape. They are very elusive, and they are connected to all domains of life. You know, just thinking of pressure or thinking of this nature, you know, evolution and competition. It's not only about your education. It is also about the job, it's about the relation with your colleagues in company, it's about uh, family formation, it's about the dating, marriage, it's about your age. Once you reach to the age of 34, you feel so scared because if you are working the IT uh, corporation, 35, probably the end of your career, what are you going to do, and etc. Um, so, I mean, then, of course, age is really special for women is related to, to, to the family relations, your status in society, gender relations, your relation with the parents, everything comes together. So how can you disentangle all that, give shape to this uh, all-embracing uh, concerns? That is a challenge. But for us, that is very important and exciting because this is how people perceive life and people. this is how people experience multiple social contradictions here, you know, contradictions come back, multiple social contradictions at the same time. So it's not only to identify contradictions, but also to have to clarify the relations between different types of contradictions. By doing this, we wanted to come up with certain descriptions or pictures uh, about life, about the world, that the readers, young people especially, can see themselves in these pictures 
And then they start self-examination. They start clarifying to themselves what worries they have and thinking through why do I have these worries and because of what kind of assumption or because of social forces and etc. And so therefore, hopefully, that will help them to find realistic and concrete uh, solutions in their life, not necessarily change society overnight, but at least uh, 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 have a meaningful life, have a meaningful, have an ethical life in a time that is full of uncertainties. I mean, you need that kind of intellectual resources uh, to make life meaningful. So that is the, the, the main uh, project that uh, uh, we are doing. It's a collective uh, effort. It is, uh, you have to do lots of experiment to see what is the best way to identify uh, the common concerns and how you can define it and how from there you uh, break it down into different components in a natural way, you know, uh, but a clear way, etc. It's, it's, it's because it's still in you know, academic research is still serious labor. Right? I believe in that. I believe in labor. Uh, you, you need the patience, so that is my 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 main uh, uh, job. And personally, I worked on quite a lot on actually COVID and you know, all the social changes and uh, related to COVID, not based on any theoretical interest, just simply because it is so uh, overwhelming. I feel just I have to look at that. And then finally, my new project is probably something about ambition. Uh, I think I mentioned that before very briefly, and the question is that uh, how do society organize individual ambition? And what is the consequences of different ways of organizing and channeling individual ambition? So that is a question. And how ambition leads to a feeling of powerlessness uh, in, for example, current uh, the, the Chinese society. That sounds so fascinating and, and a really nice kind of continuation from your previous work. Um, I imagine the listeners of this show really look forward to hearing how all of those projects unfold. Um, but for now, Xiangbiao, I want to thank you for putting time aside and for joining us on the show and to talk about your work. It's been so insightful, so inspiring. I've just been smiling and nodding my head almost the whole time. So thank you so much for for coming coming to coming on the show to talk to me. Thank you very much. That is a really nice praise, you know. I, Social thought ideas make people smile and nod. That is, because that means the idea has a life. And you can touch other people's mind and so. Thank you, Sui. Yes. Yeah, I was also smiling. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <good. laughs> <laughs> and thank you, everyone who's listening to this show. Thank you for tuning in to New Books and Chinese Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. Have a great week, everyone. And don't forget to download your own free PDF coffee, copy of Xiang Biao's inspiring book, which you'll find on the Paul, Paul Grave Springer website. Thank you so much, everyone. Goodbye.